So uh, let's talk a little bit about cloud computing. And I think we are right in the middle of building that ecosystem around the cloud, and it's going to take us another two or three years, in my opinion, to be able to kind of build a fully automated, fully federated, you know, cloud-based infrastructure. 70 microprocessors in a typical vehicle, all of the tablets and smartphones, so actually there's a lot of biomass, if you will, at the edge, not just in the center. We all recognize that we are sharing common resources when we're using the cloud. And all of the advantages of that is that we don't have to uh, pay for the capital cost of the entire cloud. We only have to pay for our usage of it. You know, we have to imagine that these kinds of federated systems are going to attract private infrastructure owners who want to join their infrastructure into a collective. I look at it holistically as a system engineer not just as a developer. And I think the way we're looking at it in this industry is a developer mentality. And I'm really trying to f push everybody in the industry to think about this as a system engineer. System engineer is like, how do you build a space shuttle to take you from here, let's say, to an orbit or take you from here to the moon? That's a complex problem, but it's also a system engineering problem. That doesn't mean you don't need developer to solve the problem for you, but you have to solve the system engineering space first before you say, what developing requirements do I need to have to make that problem successful. So the way I look at this, as I said, is more from a system engineering perspective, and that's what promote, excites me, because system the role of system engineer is solve complex problems. We have a lot of new standards and software for being able to, uh, that allows us to access uh, resources, generally computers, networks, not just computers, but also networks and storage, uh, different kinds of networks. Uh, and people are beginning to deploy and operate these on, on campuses and in companies, and uh, as well as the public clouds like, like Amazon's Elastic Compute Cloud is one that many people know. Um, but there are actually lots of other different kinds of examples, including uh, national fabric networks uh, like um, you know, Internet2 and uh, the National Lambda Rail and uh, the Department of Energy's ESNet, as well as new ways of programming networks like software-defined networks and open flow. And uh, so one of the big challenges right now is how do we integrate these different advances together in order to build complete end-to-end, -end, multi-domain uh, infrastructure services that people can use to deploy distributed applications, distributed services. The question is what architecture and other protocol issues are involved in cloud computing. I have a lot of interest in that, uh, both personally and professionally and with regard to, uh, to Google. Um, the interest I have primarily is figuring out whether we can build a relatively loosely coupled system where the different clouds are interconnectable to each other, that they share the ability to authenticate uh, users to each other, uh, to uh, protect information by suitable encryption and things of that sort, proper key management, all in strong authentication, two-factor authentication, all those various pieces can be combined in different ways in, in different clouds, but having some commonality of, uh, let's say, components is important because in order to achieve compatibility among the clouds and to make it easy for the users to move from one cloud operation to another or to combine them, there have to be a set of standards that lead to interoperability. So here I think we still have a lot of work to uh, uh, complete uh, before we can point at a, set, a body of uh, practices and say this will allow most clouds to work with each other. There's also worried about what are called the legacy-based application. An application could be 30, 40 years old, you know, maybe running on a built, you know, old IBM mainframe. Well, how do you move that application? Do we have to rewrite the code into the cloud itself, or do you have to have a sub sort of an adapter? So these are the challenges that exist in the enterprise. And when you get into the enterprise market, because you're going to end up with having customers that are worldwide, like a multinational carrier uh, outside of the just United States alone, you're going to have to end up solving a, one major problem in the cloud. And that is, how do you solve a hybrid environment in which I have a private cloud as part of my customer base, because I support consumers. I also have a private cloud as part of my enterprise customers. The reason that I think uh, hybrids will be so prevalent is for legacy systems, there's no point in going through the immense migration costs required simply to say, oh look, we moved it to a cloud-centric architecture. So they're going to continue to exist for decades, not just months. 
and they will interoperate with both private cloud solutions and public cloud solutions that inherently support cloud-centric types of applications. So uh, we have varying degrees of uh, customization possible in the cloud environments. There are other companies that make clouds that are specific, for example, to an enterprise, and IBM would fall into that category where somebody can say, I need a cloud, I need it to be inside my enterprise, and it needs this kind of functionality. IBM would uh, go and design and build such a thing. Uh, this still leaves open uh, this question of how clouds will interact with each other or whether they do at all. Uh, and I think that's still open territory. So I have two separate clouds. This cloud's got to be connected because any service I provide has to go between the two clouds. And it reminds me that, you know, technically back in, I would say, the early 2000, we were dealing with the different autonomous systems. You know, every autonomous system was a piece of IP network that are distributed across the globe. And we said, look, you know, how do you transmit traffic between one autonomous system to another autonomous system? And nobody could figure out exactly how the routing would work unless you know, we came up as an industry with a solution that says, look, if you build a federated autonomous system and build a policy management around the routing of, let's say, BGP or you know, eBGP or IBGP, you'd be able to solve the problem. And we did solve that problem. I think we're facing basically exactly the same problem we did about a decade ago in terms of how do you solve this problem of a private cloud and a public cloud. And the only way to solve that, you have to create and think about what I call hybrid cloud. A hybrid cloud is you have a thin layer distributed architecture that sits on top of a private cloud and a, and a public cloud, private and public, and would allow you to manage the quality of service. It allows you to manage the disaster recovery. It allows you to manage the, the security. So the enterprise application can easily move into the cloud-based infrastructure because the cloud, all cloud is, is about the lower cost structure. The National Science Foundation's Global Environment for Network Innovations, which is Genie. And so Genie is a multi-domain infrastructure. That means there are different parts of it that are owned and operated by different organizations. And for the most part, people who use it are using it for free, right? So it's not a commercial service like Amazon's EC2. So the question of, or public clouds in general, so the question of uh, how do you decide who gets access to it, how much resource do they get, uh, what about people who are working with them, how do you manage the set of people who have access, how do you decide who gets to say who has access? The price they pay is that they are sharing common environments and so protecting users from each other uh, is securing the data that belongs to user A from user B is very important and persuading the customers that there is adequate protection is part of the challenge of implementing a cloud and making it successful. Uh, one would have the same uh, expectations of your email uh, being segregated from other people's that they can't log in and pretend to be you. I think that one assumption that's taken for granted right now in the cloud community is that large, extremely large data centers are the way to go. And I think that if you look at what's likely to happen, you're going to find a hybrid mix of very large data centers where enormous compute tasks need to be run and there's some advantage to economies of scale, but also distributed architectures as well as highly dispersed capabilities, in fact, that may go into people's PCs running sandboxes for small-scale compute loads, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. So really the architecture is a mix of, therefore, extremely large consolidated data centers with mid-size nodes with edge computing and it all fitting together cleanly. There's a lot of innovation in networks uh, right now at the same time uh, as in the cloud space and there's a very natural interaction of those things. Networks are becoming more programmable, uh, networks are becoming more dynamically manageable so that we can allocate bandwidth on demand between points. Uh, we can allocate circuits and allow the entity that's given access to that circuit to determine how it's, how it's managed, what the protocols are used on that circuit, how the addresses work on that circuit, and so on. Because once you centralize, once you virtualize, and once you federate it, your cost structure is going to go down at least by 50, if not 75 percent. But the initial step to get to that you know, 50 to 75 percent confidence of getting to those savings is very challenging because you end up with a lot of technical issues that haven't yet been solved. Uh, for example, like a distributed architecture. You know, we are not, we don't, we are not accustomed to, to 
dealing with a lot of distributed computing. If you were to add up the total compute power, everyone talks about the hundreds of thousands of servers that are in the public cloud, but in fact there's got to be also immense compute power when you add up the literally billions of processing endpoints. Now if the data is access controlled, for example, you also need to move the metadata from cloud A to cloud B and have some assurance it will be interpreted the same way so that access control is, uh, continues to be exercised over the content. We don't have standards for that right now. In fact, we don't even have ways of uniformly representing the identity or identifier of a particular user in more than one cloud. So without getting down into too many details here, the ability to move data back and forth, to move the metadata back and forth, assure that it's interpreted correctly, is one missing piece. A second missing piece is the ability to run concurrently functionality in more than one cloud where intermediate results are being exchanged. Here you might want to take advantage of the possibility of special capabilities in cloud A, different but special capabilities in cloud B, running simultaneously a computation in which partial results are shared.